Aren't the words of that song wonderful? Wow. We come and we're welcomed in the Lord Jesus Christ just as we are. But he loves us too much to leave us that way, doesn't he? Yeah, he sure does. Well, welcome. It's good to have Rick and Lori back from uh, the Austin, Texas area and their their travels. Uh, we, Renee and I, lived in Texas. Of, uh, I think most of you know this. We lived in Texas for about nine years, many moons ago. Our kids were little at the time. And so we encouraged Rick and Lori, oh, it should be beautiful in the Austin area, hill country, uh, the temperatures just absolutely beautiful. And we heard soon after they got there that there was a tornado in the area. And we're like, oh, sorry, guys. We, yeah, we overspoke a little bit. So uh, welcome. And I, I want to um, just give a special First Baptist welcome to a pastor friend and his wife, Mark and Sandy Carls, are with us. Um, Mark and Sandy have history in the Thumb, pastoring in the Thumb. They pastored in Wisner, and then also in Pigeon, and then were in Saginaw for many, many, many years. And if I could, I don't want to embarrass Mark here, but I, I just want to say what's on my heart. Mark, Mark has, is and has been a pastor's pastor. Uh, in the Saginaw and surrounding community for many years. He's such an encouragement to other uh, pastors um, in, in Christ in the area and just a, a leader in the church in Saginaw, God's big C church, not just one individual church. So I just thank God for this brother and his wife. So, And you put pressure on me, man. And, you know, now I've got to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we're so so glad so glad you're here so glad you're here so we we have been taking um, a fresh look at jesus church and to do that we we had to spend time in matthew 28 didn't we our our memory verses this is a key passage on the lord's mission for us as his church these these words in Matthew 28 are foundational to our understanding of what church is all about. And uh, we, we've talked about this in this series. We don't want to guess at what the Lord intends for his church. We don't want to assume that we fully understand everything that Jesus intends for his church. After 2,000 years of traditional overpainting and religious varnish, do we? So we want to wrestle again with the Lord's mission for us as his people. We want to read his words plainly, interpret them normally, and obey them humbly. So let's read the scripture once again. Can we in Matthew 28, uh, verses 16 to 20. Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And will you stand with me as we read this passage together? These are God's words to us. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Go make disciples. That's our mission as a church. That's our purpose. That's exactly why we're here. And we saw in this passage that the Lord gives us one command, doesn't he? He gives us one command. And it's actually one word, isn't it? Discipleize or make disciples. And then the Lord Jesus gives us three ways that we can do that, doesn't he? He gives us three ways to do that. What are they? What are they? Yeah, go, baptize, and teach. Yeah, yeah. So there's this one command, make disciples. Three ways that the Lord gives us to make them. So literally going to make disciples and baptizing them 
and teaching them to observe. Going, baptizing, teaching. And we saw it last week, going is just that, isn't it? It's we go. We don't wait for people to come to us. We take the initiative to share the gospel of Jesus with others, to build bridges of love and good deeds, and allow the Holy Spirit to open people's hearts to the truth of God. So we take initiative. We, we are a church that, that it should be missional and focused on being missional, that is, we're going in our community more than primarily being attractional and trying to get people just on our property and in a service like this, right? We should major on being missional, and we baptize. And we saw last week that baptism is for believers. That is, it's, it's when we as an individual have consciously turned from our sin and our own ways of making ourselves right with God, and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as our only Savior, put our trust in him. When we do that individually, consciously, then our next step is is to follow him in baptism, to be baptized as a, a believer in Jesus Christ. We saw last week that it, it, from Scripture that baptism is a picture, isn't it? It's a picture of what God has already done in our hearts. We've died to our sin and our own ways of making ourselves right with God, and, and we have been raised to new life, to eternal life in Christ, to live differently after we meet him. And so baptism is a picture, but it's also a promise. Well, I was talking with uh, some people this week from our church, and, and, and they said it so well. It's, it's a public confession, isn't it? Baptism is public. And in that way, it's, it's like a wedding. I've, I've thought of it this way. It's like a wedding. You know how it goes. Uh, two young people, a, a guy and a girl, they... they like each other and they start looking at each other funny across a, a booth at the restaurant and and this thing is stirring right and they begin to like each other and date and they grow to love each other and at some point in their relationship they both make a heart commitment they they make a commitment that you, that's not tangible you can't get your hands on it you can't see it although a bride is She's looking for something a little more tangible. That guy's got to deliver a ring, right? He's, he's got to do something like this, or it doesn't count, you know. But, but yeah, they, but they, they make a heart commitment that is really pictured and proclaimed on their wedding day. Isn't that true? Yeah, that's what happens. And baptism is like that. We've already made a heart commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've given him our life for salvation. And baptism is that public profession that the Lord loves me. And he's drawn me to himself. He's forgiven my sins. He is my Savior. And it's this promise, I want to be his disciple. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. I'm committed to that. That's what baptism is. And that's why Jesus says, make disciples, baptize. Baptism is that first step in being Jesus' disciple. So those are the first two ways that we make disciples. Going, taking initiative, and baptizing. Helping people understand what God has already done. That they're saved. That they've met him as Savior. And then calling them, calling the person to make that promise. I want to commit my life to following Jesus for the rest of my life. But there's a third way in these verses. Do you see it in verse 20? There's a third way that Jesus tells us to make disciples. Verse 20, make disciples of all nations, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. I have to confess while we're talking about public confessions, that I have misread and overlooked a, a essential part of this verse, this passage of Scripture. And I did it for many years until God just kind of drew my attention and said, wait a minute, you need to read this verse correctly and understand what the Lord is emphasizing here. 
So let me ask you a few questions about what Jesus says here. What do we teach? What do we teach? It's right here in verse 20. Yeah. Obedience and all things. Heard a couple things here. Yeah. Yeah, we teach. Let's start with the content here. We, we teach all things that what? Yeah, all things that the Lord commandeth, right? So do we teach new believers, especially all the commands of the Bible, everything we do as a church, is that what we teach, especially new believers? No, not, not yet, not yet. Jesus says here, he's very specific, isn't he? Isn't he? Teach them things that I have commanded you. Now, there's, there's more to talk about here, but, but for now, just know that it's important, especially for newer believers, that they get well acquainted with their Savior, Jesus, and with their Lord, before they get into more, the, the, the more complicated, the tougher parts of Scripture. And it's not that we don't go there. It's not that we don't go there in the rest of Scripture. It's just that a great starting point for somebody who is being drawn to the Lord before they make the commitment of salvation, but especially after they come to Christ, we need to get to know our Savior really, really well. That's a good starting point for new believers. And so use, use the Gospel of Mark. I've done this many times. I'm doing it with a young man right now. Uh, use the Gospel of Mark and just get to know Jesus well. Fall in love with him. See how awesome our Savior is and see his calls to discipleship as well. His calls, his claims on our lives. That's a great starting point. All that I have commanded you. Now, how long do we teach? As a church, how long do we teach believers all that Jesus has commanded us? What do you see in this passage? What do you think? Go ahead. No wrong answers here. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Until the end of the age. When, when we think about we're teaching all that Jesus commanded, and if you're like me, your, your mind starts spinning a little bit on, wow, what are all the commands in the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what about the rest of the New Testament? Jesus, Jesus gave some commands through his apostles and the rest of the New Testament as well. Wow. That's a lot of commands. Yeah. So it's, the idea is, it's the rest of our lives. It's a lifelong process of learning from and living out what Jesus has commanded us, right? So baptism hap can happen fairly quickly, can it? I mean, the, the act of baptism literally can happen within 60 seconds time. Unless, as I said last week, pastor puts his foot on somebody and they, they start air bubbles start coming up to make sure they're really committed to the lord right <laughs> and they're trusting in god for eternal life if it happens right there. yeah yeah no we we honestly would we don't do that that's just <laughs> pastor humor but but yeah we don't do that but but yeah so baptism happens quickly doesn't it after we've looked at scripture and explained what baptism is and then called someone to commit themselves to following Christ. So after uh, a baptism class or some explanation of that, the act of baptism it, itself happens quickly, doesn't it? But teaching believers to obey everything that Jesus has commanded, that's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong process. It's not a six-week class. It's, it's not a four-week sermon series or even a 10 or 12-week sermon series. It's it's a lifetime of learning from our Savior and living out what he says. So let's go back to what is it that we teach believers? Somebody said it. So what is it? I mean, let's look at this verse. There are two things here. And one of these I overlooked for too long. What do we teach? Yeah, obedience, right? Isn't that what Jesus says here? I read this verse for many years as if the words here, New King James Version, to observe were not in this verse. I read it as teaching them 
all things that Jesus has commanded us. And that's good. That's the content of what we teach, isn't it? It's the content of how we disciple and help believers grow in Christ. And so that's good. That's true. But it's not the whole thing, is it? In fact, it's the emphasis here. The first thing Jesus says is teaching them to, the New King James says, to observe. Uh, your, your version, if you have another version, may say to obey, or even literally the word is to keep. Now, by obser- observe, it, it doesn't mean to look at closely. That's not the observe that the Lord is talking about here. He's talking about paying close attention, to keep, to pay close attention to what I have commanded, and to do it, to obey me. So discipleship is not just about content. It's not just about learning God's words and and knowing the right answers. There's so much more to making disciples than just content. You see, the Apostle Paul said, knowledge puffs up, doesn't it? Knowledge of God's word, having some of the right answers can make us proud. But love builds up. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And the Lord Jesus is going after that here. He he wants us to be examples of a soft, obedient heart. And as we help other people grow in Christ, to help them, to encourage them to have a soft, obedient heart to everything that Jesus has commanded us. Because the Lord doesn't just give us content so that we can spit out the right doctrinal answers. He doesn't just do that, does he? He, he wants us to live for him, to walk with him, to love him, uh, to, to know him. That's what the Lord calls. And so he says, we teach them to observe, to obey, to keep, to pay. The word is to pay close attention to what the Lord has said and to do it, to live it out in our lives. And so through love and truth over time, We teach others to obey with a soft, obedient heart everything that Jesus has commanded us. So those are the three ways that the Lord gives us to make disciples. We go, and we baptize, and we teach. So how will we know when those things are working? How do we know that we're making disciples as a church? What kind of people does God want us to produce at this church? Remember Lloyd Ogilvie's question from last week. What kind of people? What are we shooting at? What's our target? And it's important for us to answer these questions, or this question from God's word, because I think there, there are so many spoken and unspoken ideas about what kind of people we should be producing at our churches. Do you agree? If you've been around the church for a long time, it's It's like there are a lot of ideas about what a good Christian is. What is somebody who's close to God, who is spiritual? Well, is it people that don't miss a Sunday? People that serve in the church, especially on Sunday mornings. People who have the right answers from the Bible. People who read their Bibles and pray and give and witness. Or people who don't drink or smoke or chew or run with those who do, right? See, all, all these ideas about what is a good Christian, what, is, what does it mean to be spiritual or mature in Christ? Are these the marks of a mature believer? Are those the marks? Um, not necessarily. Are they some of the marks? They can be. So what is our target? You see, I I think as we've talked about so many churches declining, getting divided, getting distracted and focused on the wrong things and, and then dying, eventually dying, I think it can relate to this. I really do. If we aim at nothing, we'll hit it every time. We'll hit it every time. If there's no clear focus on what is our target or even even said better what is the target that god gives to us what is a disciple if these are what we're supposed to make let's be clear on 
how we know it's really happening, right? That we're doing well at it. So how do we know? Um, the Bible answer to those questions is we should be raising up mature believers. What does God want us to be when we grow up? Here's the New Testament answer. A mature believer in Christ. A mature believer in Christ. So think about it this way. If a man or woman trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning in this service, two years from now, where should they be in their walk with Christ? Where should they be? And what is the role of our church in helping them get there? You see? How do we help people to mature in Christ? That's the Bible word. That's the Bible word. Maturity in Christ. And so, you think about it, all heaven throws a party when someone comes to Jesus. And, and it does, right? The Lord tells us that in Luke 15. Heaven celebrates when someone turns from their sin and their salvation plans and turns to Christ. Heaven celebrates. And so should we. But at the same time, God the Father grieves. The Lord Jesus grieves. You see this come out in the New Testament. When someone who has met Christ does not grow to maturity. And they, they continue to live the same old way. And you see that with Paul. I, I wanted to speak to you as people who were mature in Christ, but I couldn't because you're still babies in the Lord. You're still squabbling and fighting and you have this group and that group. The writer to the Hebrews, he complains. He says, I, I should be able to speak to you as, as those who could teach this stuff. But I can't. I can't. You're not ready. You see? So you see these kinds of things come out from church leaders throughout the New Testament. God wants us raising people to maturity in Christ. You see, meeting Christ is not, is not the only goal. It's maturity in Christ meeting the Lord and then growing to maturity. And so what is maturity in Christ? What is this maturity? Well, very simply, we become more and more like Jesus in our everyday lives. That's not rocket science, is it? That's, that's just a simple, I think it captures the, the New Testament teaching on Christian maturity. We simply are becoming more and more like Jesus in our everyday lives, everyday lives. The 168, not just the one hour on Sunday morning, but the, the, the other 167 hours of the week when the chips are down and when it gets real in our, in our homes and families and workplaces and neighborhoods and our neighbors mowing over on our, I, we have a neighbor right now who mows over on our grass and actually it's kind of nice because <laughs> it's a little less, and especially with the leaves, he's picking up the leaves. I'm like, Alex, praise God, man, keep going. <laughs> it's great. But yeah, we're becoming more and more like Jesus in our everyday lives. So let's push into that a little further. In what ways do we become more like Jesus? So if you would follow this word maturity through the Bible, through the New Testament, it's, it's often in the New King, King James Version, you'll see it's often translated perfect. And we met that word in 1 John, if you were here this summer for our 1 John series. We met it in 1 John, and I said then, we tend to think of perfect as no errors, no mistakes. It's Frank Tanana pitching a perfect game. I don't know if he ever did with uh, Toronto Blue Jays. I think he came close. But, but yeah, we, we think of no errors, no mistakes, and that's perfect but that's not the New Testament word. It's not the meaning of. The word perfect, uh, I, I think better translated complete or mature, is, is a word that means that we're whole. We're complete. We're simply, we're who God created us to be. We're more like Jesus not only outside in our lives, but also inside. There's not, there's not this disparity, this gap between who I am on the inside or who I am in private 
and then who I am on the outside and who I am in public, there's, there's a wholeness. There's a wholeness to my life. There's a completeness. I'm reaching God's goal for me, for you. That's maturity. That's what this word means. We're becoming more and more like Jesus in our everyday lives. And so in what ways do we become more like Jesus? So if you do a word study on this word, I'm just going to summarize a couple things for time because it's used often in the New Testament. But you find two main thoughts. Here they are. Here's the first one. We grow more and more in our love and obedience to God. As we're growing in spiritual maturity, yes, it involves content. It involves the Bible. It involves connecting to the local body, the church. Of course it does. Of course it does. But that primary focus is we're growing more and more in our love for God and our obedience to him. We hunger to hear from God through his word. The verses that speak to that about maturity in Christ. We, we want to talk with him in prayer. He's our father. Here's one that Jesus talks about. We renounce ourselves as the authority and focus of our lives. That's a big one. As we grow in Christian maturity, it's less about what I want for my life, more about what does God want for my life? What does he want? Uh, we commit ourselves to learning sound doctrine. Ephesians 4, the word maturity there. We're learning sound doctrine so that we're not blown around by every wind of teaching. There's some stability to what we believe and how we live. Uh, we trust and obey God's word through the tough times. Uh, James 1 talks about maturity and persevering through trials. We can, we can trust God. Our faith is strong enough that that we're not just going to chuck, chuck church and, and chuck our faith because times get tough. And we're like, God, what are you, what are you doing to me? This is not what I expected. I didn't, I didn't sign up for this in my life. Well, that's, that's a misunderstanding of who God is and how he works in our life and the world that we live in right now, isn't it? But as we grow to maturity, we grow in our faith in God through the ups and downs of life. We can persevere through tough times. And our thinking and priorities align more and more with Jesus' mission. It isn't just about me. It's also about others. Right? It isn't just about me. It's not just about, God, what are, what are you doing for me lately? And, and are you blessing me? And I'm so thankful for that. And, and you've given me all this in my life. And so thank you. And we go on and our lives are closed up. And our windows are closed. No, as we grow in maturity, God wants to open our windows on how others are doing around us. Others in our family, others in our neighborhood, others in our workplace, and, and seeing practical needs as well as spiritual needs. God, as we grow maturity, God wants to open our windows to say, I want you to respond to that. And maybe it's sending a card, or maybe it's doing something practical. I, I talked about this last week, just how I, I love how uh, so many of you, and some I don't even know, but I've just heard a, so much of this and seen this in action, not just heard it, but how so many of you are uh, blessing others and encouraging others in Christ behind the scenes. Believers, unbelievers, uh, you're reaching out to so many people in practical ways, and that is godly, godly missional ministry. It is. And we never want to devalue that and overfocus, as we talked about last week, on what we do on this campus. Never devalue how God uses you in opening your windows on the needs, the spiritual needs, the physical needs of other people. And that's part of growing more and more in our love for God and our obedience to God. But there's another emphasis in this word maturity, as you, you study this in the New Testament. And that is that we grow more and more in our love and unselfish, unselfish service to other people. Our love and our unselfish service to other people. We increasingly see people as God sees them. I'm so convinced that's one of the big things Jesus did with his disciples. He's like, aren't people more 
valuable than an ox who falls into the ditch, guys? Come on. Aren't people much more valuable than our religious rules for the Sabbath day? Come on. And one of the things Jesus just, just drilled into the minds and the hearts of his disciples is the preciousness of people to our God. The preciousness of people. And how easy it is, and I, I'm pointing five finger, or ten fingers at myself right here, but how easy it is for us to put people in different categories. You know, don't we? We can put people in different categories, spiritually, economically, racially, ethnically. We can put people in these categories, and God says again and again, he is no respecter of persons. And so to grow in spiritual maturity is to increasingly see people as God sees them. For our concern for people to know Christ as Savior and for other believers to grow in Christ. It's great that we're growing, but what about others around us? We find strength to respond like Jesus did when the chips are down and when we're upset with someone, when we're in conflict. Have you ever noticed? I mean, it's, it's, it's God's grace to us, but honestly, it's a little bit embarrassing. It's God puts us in situations just to, just to show us, give us a little litmus test of where we're at in our walk with him. Does the Lord do that for you, or is it just for me? Yeah. And you know, we've had a couple situations, even, even with uh, cell phone stuff or just insurance, we're change, changing a lot of things over in, in late October. And it's just like the, the wheels are falling off things. And, you know, when that happens, my patience goes from this to about this. And it's like, okay, let me get this person on the phone and give them what's up, you know. And, and you just, you see the Lord working in your heart through the Holy Spirit and through your spouse who, no, this doesn't happen to anybody else? All right. Okay, maybe it is just me, but yeah. Yeah, you see, you see that happen, but God, God gives you these litmus tests. How are you doing? Continue to grow. Continue to trust me. And that often comes out when we're upset with others, right? When we're in conflict of some kind. But more and more, we consider the needs of others as we grow in Christ along with our own plans and decision-making. How does, how does this decision in my life affect others in our church? How does it affect others in my family? And we commit ourselves to helping others to know and follow Jesus, being part of the mission of making disciples. So think about these two things. Maturity really is wrapped up in growing more in our love and obedience to God. And it's wrapped up in growing in our love for and unselfish service to other people. Let me summarize it this way. When we are fulfilling the Great Commission as a church, people are growing in the Great Commandment. They're growing in the Great Commandment. Think about that. The Great Commandment is to what? Love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And Jesus said, the second is like unto it. They're, con they're vitally connected. Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. That's maturity. And when people are growing in maturity, that's what our lives look like more and more. That's our target. What are we aiming at in making disciples? Mature Christians. Mature as God defines maturity. What kind of people does God want us to produce at our church? That kind of people. Mature believers, growing mature believers in Christ. People becoming more like Jesus in their everyday lives. At home, in work, in public, in private. Inwardly and outwardly, that's our goal. That's our target. And so these, these lesser things, uh, Pastor John Piper has talked about this in a number of ways, and I love what he says about this. Let's not shoot too low as a church. Let's not lower our expectations of, well, it's great if people are here every Sunday and if they're serving in some way on Sunday morning. Don't misunderstand me. Those are wonderful things, and those are part of growing to maturity in Christ. 
But please hear me. That's a small part. That's a small part. Because we know, we, we not only individually experience the, the temptation, the draw, to be one thing in this building, to present ourselves publicly a certain way, and then to go home and be very different privately. Some of us have grown, even grown up in homes like that. And we know the hurt of that kind of hypocrisy. And I'm not condemning that. I'm not condemning that. If anything, I'm looking at us as church leaders, as pastors, as elders, as deacons, and saying, guys, we need to push through this and make sure that people are growing authentically in Jesus Christ in public and private. And it's showing up in our homes with our spouses and our children and grandchildren and neighborhoods and workplaces. You see, that's what God wants. That's Jesus' command to make disciples. So how are we doing? How are we doing? If making disciples is, is our business as a church, how's business? If it's job one of what we do, how are we doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing in inviting others to know Jesus, of building bridges of, of love and good deeds to others? How am I doing? How are we doing at helping believers in Jesus in this congregation grow in Jesus? And not assuming that it's happening, not saying, well, that's the pastor's and the elder's job, but being involved as God gives us connection to encourage and to help others grow. How are we doing? And let me ask you this. As I ask these questions, how does that make you feel? How does it make you feel? What do these questions do to you? You see, if we take the Lord's mission seriously as a church and as his followers, we can't help but swallow hard. I do. I do. It, we feel inadequate. Living out the Lord's mission, being the church of Jesus Christ in our generation, it's not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible without the power and the work of the Holy Spirit among us and us responding to that. You see, let's be honest. As a church, we can easily get distracted and divided. And when we try to share the truth of the gospel with others, people resist the gospel message, don't they? Now, let's be honest. Even believers resist the truth of God's word, don't they, as we try to disciple. It, it's hard for us individually to be open. We have our own struggles. How can I help someone else mature in Christ when I got my own stuff going on, right? I need to grow too. So when do I start helping others grow in Christ when I'm still figuring things out myself. Yeah, you see, it's, it's, we feel inadequate. We're busy, aren't we? We're busy people. We can wrestle to have the right priorities. So many things can distract us. Or if you're, if you're like me, you've tried to witness to people over the years, to talk with people about gospel truth, to sit down and dis disciple others, even disciple them through some difficult life situations. And we fail. We fail. People don't trust in Christ. People walk away from the Lord, from the church. That's a hard thing. All, all of this has happened in my life, in Renee's life as well, as we've tried to faithfully share the gospel with Jesus and with other family members, as we've tried to disciple people. Wow. It's an up and down thing. It's not easy. It's impossible, in fact, in our own strength, isn't it? Do you remember two weeks ago when we started looking at this passage, I said that there are two all statements that Jesus gives us that surround his command to make disciples. There are two all statements. The first is in verse 16. We saw this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority authority has been given to me. Jesus is about to ascend into heaven and be glorified and, and be crowned, literally, 
the, the, the ultimate king and potentate of the, the universe, of the world. All authority has been given to him. And so it's not only, as we talked about a few weeks ago, it's not only the, the nudge to obey what I tell you. All authority has been given to me. I'm the head of the church, not you. And we do need to hear that. But I think there's something more that Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I can help you. I can break through the barriers of being a New Testament church in your generation. I, I, can, I can give you strength to overcome the resistance of people to the gospel, the, the distractions of this culture to people genuinely growing in Christ and serving Christ with different priorities. I, I can give you strength to do that. I, I can give you power to overcome the devil's attack directly on this body of believers in Jesus. All authority has been given to you. He can do that. But there's a second all statement. It's at the end of verse 20. I want you to see it. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always. Or literally, you could translate this, all the days. All the days. Every day. All the days. Even to the very end of the age. Even to the end of the age. The first all is a promise of the Lord's power to help us as individuals and as a church carry out his mission of making disciples. This second all is a promise of Jesus' presence. That's what it is. It's, it's a promise of his presence. I am with you in the trenches, in, in the everyday of doing church, in the everyday of making disciples and, and doing your best to be a witness to this community individually and as a body of believers through things like our upcoming warming state. I am with you. I'm guiding you. I'm advising you as the head of the church. I'm comforting you and encouraging you when it gets tough in this culture, in this community. I am with you. It's a promise of the Lord's presence. But in a special way, this promise of his presence, I think, is tied directly. It seems to be in this, in this passage of Scripture, tied directly to our focus on his mission. It's tied to our focus on his mission. What do I mean? Do we as a church want the special presence of our Savior? If we know Christ, we know the Holy Spirit is, lives within us and is present with us. But do we want the special presence of the Lord among us? Do we want the, the filling of the Holy Spirit and to see the obvious blessing of God and the joy of the Holy Spirit among us as a group of believers? We need to commit ourselves to fulfilling the Lord's mission for us and making disciples. We need to commit ourselves to it. If we want to experience the the special presence and the work of the Lord in our lives as individual believers, then be part of his mission of making disciples. Be part of his mission of making disciples. And the Lord says, as you commit yourselves to this mission that I've given you, make disciples of all nations, I am with you day to day to the very end of the age. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we, we just want to thank you for your word and for the clear mission that you have given to us as a church. Though we don't want to guess at it, we, we don't want to assume that we know it. After these 2,000 years, we want really and honestly to take a fresh look at Jesus' church and to strive and to work and to pray and to trust your presence, your power, to make us into that kind of church. And so, Lord, we pray that, that you will encourage our hearts. We pray that you will challenge our hearts to be your church, to be your people. And, Lord, continue to use us, grow us, use us, 
may you be specially present among us. May we be filled with your spirit as the congregation, your church called First Baptist Church of Bad Axe. That's what we pray for. So lead us, Lord. Guide us. Teach us. Use us. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.